very warm welcome to everybody i am shrija agrawal and you are watching yet another episode of mint inside india is currently going through its worst economic slowdown as in the last 70 years we are seeing slowdown in the consumption space liquidity crisis in financial market a huge environment of mistrust and gloom and doom in this scenario the government of india has rolled out a series of steps in course correction essentially to revive investment cycle and attract foreign capital talking about course correction we actually saw on this show experts calling the super rich tax on fpis a result of arrogant policy making which can have harsher consequences We've already seen a rollback on the super rich tax on FPIs. Late evening, we saw the easing of foreign investment restrictions on certain sectors. Is it really the second era of liberalisation that we're seeing in the economy, or really the garb of it? We have two legal experts trying to understand and decode the implications of this in the investment landscape. Please help me welcome Mohin Lada from Khetan and Company and Nishant Singh from Intus Law. Thank Gentlemen, you. thank you for talking thank to you. us. Thank you. Thank you. Mohin, my first question to you really yeah. is that you know we saw a series of steps late last evening in 100% opening of FDI in the coal space, then you know the easing of norms in the single brand retail area. You know people are really positioning this as you know huge liberalisation happening. You know an open invitation to the IKEA, H&M, BHP, and the core of the world if launch of capital will come to india right. you know positive sound bites coming in like you know we can actually take china's position as manufacturing hub i really want to understand from you is it truly the liberalization you're talking about or are they devil in the details in the final print okay so i'll 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 break my response in two parts so the first part is that i do agree that the government has taken positive steps and certainly this will bring uh you know sort of impact positive impact on the fdi as well so for example for the coal sector it will be advantageous it will create a more competitive invest, uh, environment as far as single brand retail is concerned as well the the sourcing requirement relaxation uh, coupled with you know have allowing an e-commerce platform even before a brick and mortar presence these two will be advantages but that being said uh, so far as contract manufacturing and digital media is concerned uh i have a few thoughts so for digital media to be honest uh, there would i believe in the fine print need to be clarity because until now there didn't seem to be any specific restriction included in the policy and if there are no restrictions on a particular sector in the policy one could look at it as a liberalized or an automatic route sector so whether this limit of 26% in reality is going to be a restriction or whether the fine print will clear out and you know sort of give its carve outs and exemption for aggregators or such other similar place to platforms is something that we need to see further as far as contract manufacturing is concerned because manufacturing as an activity was not restricted in the schedule of the FDI policy it has always been looked at as an automatic route activity so the contract manufacturing liberalization more to me it looks as if it's a clarification uh as opposed to an actual liberalization because manufacturing could always be conducted and there was no limitations on who you were manufacturing for so those are really my preliminary thoughts on these uh, you know amendments that have been uh, approved really interesting yeah. no mine spoke about this entire confusion around digital media space mm-hmm. so for sure i think in the digital media space uh, this was a surprise because there was kind of uh, silence in the fdi policy and the digital media was really growing very fast and all of a sudden when people are seeing this 26% gap it begs the question how many digital platform which have already flourished right they're going to actually going to restructure this so the fine print there is going to be important but up front this 26% gap is going to be highly restricted for the digital media growth uh, i'm not too sure i just went through the cabinet uh, you know minutes is saying that if you want to stream or upload material then there is a cap at 26% what does this mean is it like if someone is just streaming live media through internet medium that's where your platform cannot have fdi of more than 26% or is it saying that any kind of digital media because there are variety of digital media which has been sort of uh, funded by private equity players uh, uh, and this is very very crucial for foreign investment to my mind uh, since this was supposed to be a very clear area and all of a sudden there seems to be restriction 
is actually stoking anxiety at this moment. Interesting. So digital media was actually outside the ambit of FDI till That's now. That's right. Now the thing <clears throat> is, how do you define digital media then? You know, what does the government really think of digital media? Does the is Facebook digital media, is shared chat digital media, or the likes of the Woot or you know scroll and these are digital media? How does one define that? So I think uh, what they've mentioned is news and current affairs, and whatever we could sort of gather uh, from a quick reading was that they seem to treat uh, digital media concerned with news and current affairs akin to digital me print media. Now, from that perspective. There are a lot of questions around and what's going to be very, very relevant is how this will be defined. Because there are so many platforms which are only aggregators, which are picking up feeds from international media houses or, you know, picking up international news, news feeds. So if this definition is very broad and includes each and everything within its ambit, it's going to have a very unusual impact. And all of that at a time when we are positioning these amendments as liberalization. So that's really the question that's in all our minds and I So it's hardly liberalization, sure. restrictive. As far as this sector is concerned, and I'm very, very sure that the government would consider these points when the fine print and I'm hoping that the fine print will address these mm. issues. But uh, that's really the point, because if the intention is to liberalize this sector and uh, facilitate better business, then clearly just the sector 26% restriction will not really help. I think yeah. we spoke about digital, we're talking really about contract manufacturing. You know, technology giants like Apple have mm -hmm. really been gunning for this because this essentially helps them sort of, you know, reduce their cost, enhance their margins, right? We, are, we already had manufacturing, but the law was kind of silent on contract manufacturing. I want to understand from both of you that since yesterday, what the kind of conversations have you had with your clientele mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, opening up these, you know, these technology giants, opening up hubs in India, and it really comes at a time when U.S. China relations are in the middle of sort of, you know, we are in the middle of a trade war, a global mm -hmm. trade war. And people are saying that a lot of low end manufacturing can perhaps shift to India. India can take China's place manufacturing hub. Do you see us moving close to that reality? I think so. Given the trade war and the global recession dynamics, uh, it's a great arbitrage opportunity for India. And at this moment, foreign investors, mm -hmm. when you look at contract manufacturing, especially, for companies like IKEA or Apple, the investment amount is huge. And at that level, you need not only direction, clarity, but certainty in the policy. If Apple were to decide to move their manufacturing uh, or any other company from China to India, then they need to be sure that the trade war is not happening with India also, right? Uh, because that seems to be the trigger, otherwise China uh, was working out fairly well. Mm -hmm. Interesting, we spoke about digital media and contract manufacturing. My next question really is about this 100% FDI in the coal space, you know. This space largely in India has been monopolized by Coal India. And experts really believe that unless you have a formal coal sector, unless you remove restriction on price controls, you know, one does not necessarily think that, you know, global players like BHP and Glencore would like to dirty their hands, which is actually is one of the most cartelized markets in the world. What do you think? What is your sense there? No, I think uh, so far as Coal India is concerned, my understanding is that there are some special exemptions and they, they have some exemptions from the bidding process and they have some boutique of mines that they have access to. So their proposition to that extent is pro protected uh, and they have a unique position. And that being said, uh, foreign players will need to analyze the opportunity really in the actual coal mining business. But what's also been clarified is that all related activity to develop infrastructure support or do anything to do with coal mining and the business of selling, uh, which was earlier prohibited, uh, that per se to my mind is a positive development and will certainly create interest and better competitiveness in this industry, which was earlier very, very restrictive and dominated by Coal India and government uh, you know, owned companies. Uh, also, this could be a signal, as you mentioned in the beginning, that this is another era of liberalization where sectors, which has otherwise been totally protected, are now being opened up and uh, foreign investment is being permitted in these sectors. Interesting. So, you know, I want to now come 
to the last sector which we really talked about a lot and it's really been spoken so much about India being the largest consumer markets in the world. You know, we already had FDI and single brand retail, but it came with some bit of restrictions. First, of course, was, you know, 30% local sourcing norms and you, and you need to have an online presence before you go fully offline. Now, do we see that it's an open invitation to the H&M or IKEA or Apple to just come and there's an avalanche of capital coming in here? What is your sense there? Be big boost to the consumer space. Mishan, maybe you can begin with this. Definitely, uh, the relaxation is a deal sweetener right now because uh, the earlier conditions were onerous. You had to put upfront capital uh, before you start to see the viability of your brand in India on a standalone basis, right? So, if you were to open your physical stores before you launch the retail, that was a huge capital investment. Uh, you have to meet your local sourcing requirement, but now. This is very, very wide saying that globally, if you're sourcing from India, even for a third party, uh, you can meet your obligation. If you are manufacturing in India and you are exporting, that will also be included. So overall, this is definitely a sweetener. Uh, if there is a single brand uh, which wants to test the waters, at least you can test the waters without having to incur big uh, cost because presumably you have your uh, internet portal, uh, website, uh, all you got to do is plug and play for India and set up the back-end infrastructure. Uh, definitely government has uh, many things in mind when they're looking at it because uh, the economy is sagging, they need to spur employment and uh, they are seeing with other big internet giants, uh, logistics and back-end infrastructure has really helped to create big jobs. The warehousing has definitely helped to create big infrastructure facilities. So hopefully um, it will sort of entice many foreign uh, single brand uh, owners to come and test out the Indian consumer market in India. Interesting, so, Mohan, what is sort of your view here? So I think uh, global sourcing being covered in that low requirement of 30% is certainly going to be a great advantage for companies like H&M, IKEA, who otherwise been having a lot of global sourcing being done. And uh, a lot of players who were otherwise hesitant to come in and set up a physical presence for other issues associated with it, which could be, and suppose the brand didn't really give them the value they were expecting and they wanted an exit. It's very, very difficult once you've had a physical presence to even get an exit uh, of your investment. So allowing e-commerce and giving a two-year period to actually set up physical presence does give investors time to test waters and see how they're able to sort of, you know, perform in this market. I, I, I think uh, this is certainly going to work very well for brands which have a local sourcing from India. Otherwise, uh, if they're still sourcing their materials from other jurisdictions, the sourcing requirements still continue to be a problem. But brands that have a connection with India will have an advantage with these amendments. Yeah. Okay, my last question, concluding remarks, if you were to give me like one hit and one miss that came out of, you know, yesterday evening's announcement, what would those be, you know, in terms of, you know, mm -hmm. taking a step forward with liberalization or perhaps taking a step backward and being restrictive, what would that really be? So I think uh, the coal sector and the single brand retail sector clearly should be hits that have really going to create more liberalization and will be better. Uh, as far as uh, digital media is concerned, I unless we've seen the fine print at the moment, I think it's something that is taking a step back and making it a little more restrictive. As for, And contract manufacturing as well, while it is just clarifying and creating, uh, you know, clarity that ma ma contract manufacturing will be permitted, it just seems to give a feeling that are we really moving to a, you know, sort of regime where everything will need to be clarified before investments are undertaken. Because till today, the belief is Given the FDI policy schedule, the manufacturing has always been under the automatic route. What about you, Nishant? I'll take the digital media first. So definitely there's a sense, uh, besides foreign direct investment, the government is trying to control how the media is actually you know, growing in yeah. this country. So you have control over the TV channels. Internet is uh, running amok. Right. So in that space, government is trying to figure out when social media is spreading news, uh, government needs to really control. OK, interesting viewpoint here from Nishan that, you know, media seems to be going amok and there seems to be a certain sense of clamp down here. Right. I want to understand from you when you want to sort of contribute to that sense. No, of I think argument. I think if that that's the intention, you know, of the government to clamp down, then it's going to be really, really difficult because news and current affairs is the reference point that they've used in the amendments. And if 
if we are looking at including anything and everything, including a social media platform which is being used to transmit news live or any international platform which is accessible from India, the clampdown will have to be very, very wide because there is a lot of difficulty on how such kind of uh, you know broadcast will be controlled by the government, though that may be the intent, if, if that may be the intention. Thank you. We just heard from my experts that there is a huge intent to open up the sector. It can actually have positive implications on the investment landscape. But there are certain sectors which are actually giving us a sense of clampdown, if you will. And that can be really dangerous. On that as a sign off, we'll see you next time. And till the time we see you, goodbye and good luck. Thank you.